today uh, we're going to hear from members of our class who have uh, gone into different sectors outside of, of the traditional paths that some people have taken, and there'll be a mixture. So we'll hear a little bit about uh, healthcare management, clinical practice, the biopharmaceutical industry, healthcare investing, and if, if you know what a TED Talk is, this will have the sort of feel of a, of a TED Talk. And our moderator, in the same way that John Epstein moderated earlier, is Dr. Uh, Donald O'Rourke. And I'm, I'm really pleased that he's taken time out of his busy uh, schedule to do this. If our hospital CEO was here, Don, he, he would be worried that you're not in the operating room getting things done. He's, he's a busy neurosurgeon, uh, but also a, a scientist, very focused on one of the great challenges that we have, and the final frontier of cancer is probably going to be glioblastoma, along with anaplastic thyroid cancer, pancreatic cancer, and adrenal cancer. So there, there are these types of tumors that we just don't have uh, good therapies for. And his background and training is ideally suited to tackle this. Uh, he's trained as a, as a neurosurgeon, uh, but he also trained in, in immunology. He's got some interesting clinical trials underway uh, using the chimeric antigen receptor uh, in T cells as a strategy to attack potential targets in, in glioblastoma. I just want to give you a, a little bit of, of his credentials. He's a tenured associate professor in neurosurgery here, a founding member of our Center for Cancer Pharmacology, director of the Human Brain Tissue Bank, founding member of the Philadelphia Coalition for the Cure, uh, this is a first-of-its-kind precision medicine approach uh, supporting collaborative research on, on brain tumors. And interestingly, it crosses uh, both pediatric and, and adult. And he's celebrating his 30th reunion as a proud member of the class of 87, Dr. O'Rourke. Thank you very much, Dean Jamison. And thank you for the panelists for making the trip here. This is going to be a great session. Um, and I'm still here 30 years, and people, people say to me, what are you doing here? Why are you still there? And there, there are reasons for it. I'll just touch on those very briefly before we get to the talks. And I, I hope all of you get a chance to walk around the campus and see the changes, because it really is dramatic. But among all of the changes, there are are two major constants which have kept me here. And I'm sure you, you'll, this will resonate with you if you have time to walk around. The first is just the gift that we have here of having a medical center and a medical school integrated with a campus. It's not talked about much, but at least for me personally, it's been an amazing thing over the years to be able to walk down Hamilton Walk or Locust Walk, or across the College Green, right next to the hospital, integrated with the medical school. Um, you know, in some ways, I feel like I've never left college. I've never left that scholarly, intellectual environment. And it's just a, v a real jewel of the University of Pennsylvania to have this integrated campus. And for me, it's, it's a little bit more personal because my daughter is an undergraduate now in the College of Arts and Sciences, and she's getting interested in science. And it's, uh, it's an amazing thing for a parent to, to see that and actually be able to see your daughter while she goes to college, too. So. The second constant here is this incredible spirit of innovation that um, is really in the DNA of this place. Uh, it's, it's part of the culture, and it really impresses me all the time with colleagues and people who come back. The innovative spirit of this place has kept me here and others, and it's so gratifying. And that innovation is on display in so many areas. In the operating room, for example, just during my career, the development of technology and MRI-based surgery in the operating room, it's been astounding how it's transformed how we do neurosurgery. In the laboratory with genomics and the genomic application to cancer, in my case, brain cancer, and we're going to hear 
more about that in a, in a, in a short bit. And then this, this entre, entrepreneurial and translational innovation that's really within the culture now, particularly uh, with the advent of T-cell therapy over the last several years. This is a unique place right now where we can actually go from academic bench all the way through preclinical testing to academic clinical trials, all the way to industry registration trials here, right here, just at the University of Pennsylvania, the way the infrastructure is set, the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship. So it's those two driving forces that have kept me here. And I just wanted to make note of that because I'm sure those points will resonate with, with all of you as you come back and meet your, your colleagues and, and classmates. Now, getting on to the, the talks, the spirit of innovation is a good segue because that's what we're going to hear about. I looked this up. I didn't actually know what a TED talk was, but TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And I think we're going to hear aspects of all of those three points today. The actual founder in 1984 thought that the TED talks were for ideas worth spreading. And I think that's very much in the spirit of what we're going to hear about today. We have five distinguished alumni from several different classes. And I was impressed, as Larry just commented on, on really the breadth of activity of these people. From entrepreneurship to innovation, national leadership positions, global outreach. I mean, it's really been remarkable what these individuals have accomplished. And it also gives us a, a real illustration of what a Penn medical degree can do as a springboard. Um, in some cases, probably a major springboard for career accomplishment and activity and achievement. So I'm very pleased to, to introduce the speakers and to get the discussion going. And we're going to start with Dr. Mitch Blunt, Blutt, who has had uh, really a very close relationship with the University of Pennsylvania. He's been on countless boards, uh, graduating in, in 1978 uh, from the undergraduate class and then getting degrees in 1982 and from Wharton in 1987. He's presently CEO of Consonance Capital um, and also maintains a clinical relationship with Cornell. He graduated from the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Fellowship Program, which has been a very well-known program here at Penn for many years, starting off with J.P. Morgan and countless board participations. I'll just mention a few. The Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, the Board of Trustees of the Medical School, and presently is on uh, the board of the University of Pennsylvania. I hope he'll give us some insight on his uh, experience with innovation across many disciplines. Dr. Blood, welcome. One more thing I'll mention, uh, I should have said this at the outset, the talks will be approximately 10 minutes and I'm gonna do what I can to be uh, as strict to that timeline as possible so that we can get through and have time for discussion. Mitch. Microphone works? Yes, it does. I mean, if it's a TED talk, I have to stand out here, right? <laughs> and, I, and I need to wear a black turtleneck. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot my black turtleneck. Um, I'm going to talk to you, and by the way, who changes the slides? Do I? <laughs> okay, that happens in every talk. I'm going to talk to you about what the title says, um, and I, I mean it quite sincerely that. Um, what I've been doing for the past 30 years has been a substantial contributor to uh, the eventual destruction of American society. So we, we, we just done, thank you, just reviewed this. Um, I put this, this here because we were asked, all, all, all of the speakers were asked to talk a little bit about what our lives were like at Penn. What did Penn do uh, to get them started into these careers? And, Penn did everything for me. Um, you, know, you heard I went to school three times here. I did my fellowship here, which was kind of two parts of a fellowship here, both the general medicine section as well as the clinical scholars program. And then some years later came back as a university trustee and 
et cetera, Penn Medicine trustee, School of Arts and Sciences board member. The next career, which also Don referenced, uh, could not have possibly happened had I not come through all of these years at Penn. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in these 10 minutes. So how did this mayhem unfold? What happened here? How did, how did, how did a physician trained at the first and finest medical school in the United States end up contributing to the destruction of American society rather than something positive? Um, Penn provided the foundational knowledge and academic education, and Penn Medicine provided the, the foundational medical knowledge and the, the perspective on how to be a doctor and how to think as a physician. Some of that was further bolstered by my residency at Cornell in New York. Um, and then I began to have some voices. I wasn't hearing voices that weren't there. There were some voices saying to me, and I think New York City might have had something to do with this. They were saying to me, um, there's something about healthcare that is other than or in addition to what we learned in medical school. There's something about the healthcare industry. There's something about the financial aspects of healthcare. Maybe I can find a way to learn more about that. And that's what led me through my fellowship here, which included the Wharton MBA. I did it as an academic exercise. I did not do it with any ambition to become a healthcare investor or any other sort of business person. I did it for the knowledge, but, um, but I got kind of hooked. So this man, uh, I don't know if anyone here knew Sam Martin, but he ran the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program at Penn, along with Sankey Williams, who many of you do know, who's an active faculty member here. Um, and people talk about being mentored and the value of mentors. I think we all identify a mentor or two who contributed greatly to the direction we took. And I would say in the case of Sam Martin, mostly made it okay, but um, remarkable impact on my professional life and probably life overall. Um, distinguished academic physician, internist, um, was the first physician on the board of what was then Smith Klein Beecham, uh, became Glaxo Smith Klein, uh, had something to do with the discovery of Tagamet and the commercialization of Tagamet. Um, he was an influence. And I asked Sam the question one day what's venture capital? Because I think it sounds cool. And Sam said, I don't know but we're gonna find out together. And um, he made some phone calls, and I made some phone calls, and I ended up spending the summer with uh, what was actually not really a venture capital firm, but they did some venture capital. It was a private equity division of the early predecessors to J.P. Morgan Chase. And I did it for fun because I was an academic doctor, and it's now 30 years later and I became a healthcare investor. And I have struggled mightily with a little bit of success to retain some identity as an academic physician uh, throughout these 30 years. I do my best with that. Um, all of you who are academic physicians and all of you who are practicing clinicians would not consider what I do in the academic medical community to be the real deal any longer. Um, but it's, it's my primary identity. I am an academic physician first. I'm a healthcare investor and other business things, second, third, and fourth, um, at least in my own mind. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about what it means to be a physician investing in the healthcare industry. That's what I do. I invest in the healthcare industry. That's how I spend most of my professional time. We look at companies that have molecules or serv business, healthcare service models or medical devices or all sorts of anything healthcare, healthcare information technology solutions, and we try to decide if those are businesses that we can help grow in size and value, and will those be successful investments for us. So I realized early into this journey that there's something very different about how a physician is trained to how a financial professional is trained. And I just want to give you four 
contrasts. And it's taken me my whole career, and I'm still working on reconciling these differences. One is, from a physician's point of view, clinical trials matter. Science matters. You will be shocked, if you aren't already, at how little understanding there is in the non-scientific community about science. This is why people still believe that vaccines cause autism. Forgive me if people in this room believe that, but there is no science to so support that. This is why people, some people are still afraid of cell phones. Um, this is why people are, we have a neurosurgeon here in case I'm wrong about that. This is why, this is why people are afraid of power stations because they don't actually understand randomized clinical trials. They don't understand the scientific method. We do, but most of the rest of the community out there, especially in the business community, are not we, and they don't. They're more focused, not, not in a cruel or evil way, on marketing and sales, on can the product be sold? Oh, science? Okay, well, can we use the science to sell it? Not, let's not sell it if it doesn't have scientific proof. And by the way, I'm okay with that, because we need a lot of things in medicine that don't have absolutely certain scientific proof. We can let physician judgment, which is the next point, or clinical judgment by all practitioners, be a driver. So clinical judgment matters, but in the business community or financial community, it's, it's a little more about supply and demand. And again, if they can weave in the use of clinical judgment, they will. I had a physician, and I'm mindful of my 10 minutes of total time availability. I had a physician faculty member when I was a resident at Cornell uh, named Barry Hartman, infectious disease doc. He had a little contest that he ran where uh, house officers could win a bottle of wine if they enrolled, whoever enrolled the most patients in his clinical trial, at the time he was studying Aztreonam for urinary tract infections, it was not an approved drug yet. Whoever could enroll the most patients would win a bottle of wine. I'm pretty sure that's probably illegal now, but I won the bottle of wine. And it struck me at the time that this Dr. Barry Hartman, who I'm still a little friendly with, was such a clever guy. He came up with this idea of this drug and that it might actually treat E. coli urinary tract infections. When, in fact, the healthcare industry thinks that's their idea. That's not the scientist's idea. The scientist is a, a respected tool in their process. Again, I don't mean to put them at odds. They're not at odds. But it's a different way of thinking. And finally, and the most important difference is that we as physicians are trained to minimize risk, to gather data endlessly before we make a clinical decision. Obviously, if it's a stat decision, we have to deal with less, but most decisions are not stat. Whereas in the financial community, if you wait to gather all of the information, you will have reduced the risk to such a low level that there won't be sufficient return. So in fact, it's a diametrically opposed way of thinking, and I struggled with that in my early years in this industry. But over these many years, we invest in lots of companies. This is probably a tenth of the companies we've invested in. They span through biotechnology, uh, medical products, healthcare services, some healthcare information technology. You may know some of them. You may never have heard of many of them, but we've sort of been all over the map. As I sort of suggested, and I want to reiterate this, there is great value in being a physician in the world of healthcare business, healthcare finance, and healthcare investing. It's not a prerequisite, but there is great value because you cannot understand what illness really is without having gone to a great medical school like this. You cannot understand how the delivery system really works if you've never worked in it. And that's why oftentimes when there are physicians who never did any training, I view their thinking differently than if they had at least done residency training, and, 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 and especially if they did more training than that. So now I want to begin the conclusion of my talk by referencing back to the title, what, Where's the Destruction of American Society? What's that all about? We are in an explosive innovation cycle. Don referred to that. I don't think there is any disputing that. Fantastic things have happened and are happening. In our lifetime, 
life expectancy, for all of the criticism that the US healthcare system receives, life expectancy in the United States increased by almost a decade in one lifetime, and, 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 on, a, and on a developed world basis. So many areas of medicine, rheumatology today has dramatically more options in treatment than it did just 20 years ago. And you could go through neurological illnesses and various malignancies and so on and so forth. And in the health services environment, innovative methods of taking care of patients at home, data analytics, behavioral economics, these are highly effective new tools for taking care of patients more effectively. And they're just exploding. It's an incredibly exciting time. So what's wrong with that? There's a storm brewing. We actually already have the rain from the storm. I guess we'll see some of it tomorrow. What's the storm? We can't afford this. We can't afford it. Not just America can't afford it, society can't afford it. The global society can't afford it. We are the victims of our own discovery success. These discoveries are costly. The notion of inventing a new product and having that extend life is so obviously appropriate, but it comes with a cost. These factors, these discoveries, especially in a fee-for-service environment, but I would argue not diminished as much as people would like, in a fee-for-value environment are potentially bankrupting to this country uh, and to the world as we know it. And I don't mean to create drama. There are just some financial facts to this. There, there is massive consumption, costs are high, and the more life gets extended, the more the cost rises because people live longer and they require care longer. No one is even close to figuring this out. We need to figure this out, all of us. I'll use one quick example in primary prostate cancer treatment. We, have, we were talking about this earlier. We have some of the greatest tools in the history of surgical medicine being used to remove people's prostates. The Da Vinci surgical robot, proton therapy, other forms of innovative uh, radiation therapy, and yet, and, and what happened in pro primary prostate cancer? It became, this $15 billion is actually a couple years old. It's, it could be a $20 billion annual cost in the United States. And is there a definitive clinical advantage over watchful waiting? Not sure. In some cases, yes, not sure. Is this even cancer? What if we didn't call primary prostate cancer cancer? I assure you that there would be dramatically less interventional treatment. But this is, this, this is, the Da Vinci robot is a fantastic innovation, but it's a problem from a cost and, and societal impact point of view. I'm not discouraging its use. I'm just saying we need to reconcile this. So there was an audio effect that I was going to close with, but unless there's someone in the room who's going to tell me how to do it. Ah. Can whoever successfully controlled that, can you stop that and I'll just narrate this page for a moment? June 12th, 2030. This is, sorry, let me give you a pre preface. This is from a book by Albert Brooks, the comedian. He wrote about six, seven years ago called 2030. The premise is uh, it's 2030. Cancer has been cured sort of 10 years earlier. That's a couple of years from now. Uh, some other things have been cured, and there's been a lot of medical innovation. So, June 12, 2030, started out like any other day in memory. And by then, memories were long. Since cancer had been cured 15 years earlier, sorry, I was off by five years, America's population was aging rapidly. That sounds like good news. But consider this. Millions of baby boomers with a big natural predator picked off were sucking dry benefits and resources that were never meant to hold them into their 80s and beyond. Young people around the country simmered with resentment toward the olds and anger at the treadmill they could never get off just to maintain their parents' entitlement programs. Not a great book, but a great premise. I'm gonna close with this slide. 
I was at a meeting in Washington uh, in September, so in the past presidential administration, and it was a congressional discussion on pharmaceutical pricing. Small room, a dozen Congress people. The leading Democrat in the room said to me, my biggest fear is if we don't find a really effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease because the cost of caring for the epidemic of Alzheimer's disease is unbearable for our society, not to mention the heartache. The leading Republican in the room rose to his feet and said, my biggest fear is if we find a pharmaceutical treatment for Alzheimer's disease because the cost of that drug over the size of this population who then goes on to live for three, five, eight years will bankrupt our society. I'm an optimist. I don't mean to leave you with pessimism. Thank you very much. I'm not sure how to follow that or what to say. <laughs> uh, there's a lot we could talk about there. Thank you very much, Mitch. Lisa Castleth is next. Graduated um, undergraduate class of 1992, medical school class of 94, did her residency, finishing in 2003. I'm very familiar with her, the program from which she graduated, this combined six-year plastic and general surgery training program at Penn, which is been very prolific, has a great history, and uh, a lot of accomplished graduates of this program. Lisa went out to Los Angeles, it seems, um, and uh, really had an incredible um, series of innovative breakthroughs. First, surgically, she's, uh, she's the developer of this castle with one stage breast reconstruction, which is a real surgical technical innovation, but also this real entrepreneurial um, route that she took, uh, where she founded the Bedford Breast Center and this um, plastic surgery center with her name in 2004. So um, she has a thriving business surgery center. She's obviously a very strong advocate for women's health and really a great example for innovation in surgery and business. We're very interested in hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Lisa. Let me see if I can get this right. If I need to use the mouse, how do I do that? Anybody good at this? Aha. Aha. Okay, I got it now. Yeah. All right. Thank you for asking me to talk today. And I have something a little more interesting. You guessed it, it's boobs, <laughs> okay? I think we're gonna be a little perked up by this talk. Uh, so I think the interesting part in putting this together for me was not just the technical things that I've done in my career, but also putting it together um, in terms of multiple problems, all interrelated, Sometimes I feel like I'm using the same tool to solve many different problems. So really, the topics become how are one-stage breast reconstruction, curing capsular contracture, and creating a new aesthetic breast lift all interrelated. So I'm going to talk very briefly for those of you who aren't intricately familiar with breast cancer reconstruction, that traditionally, this is now back in the 80s, this was done as three surgeries. So the original surgery was a mastectomy, the patient was left with a flat chest and a large scar. And then as plastic surgeons, we got to come in at a second surgery, put a tissue expander in, and then over time, put saline through a port, and then go back on a third surgery and put an implant in. Now, um, in the 90s, this was really updated to a two-surgery operation. We thought, we're great. Look at the breakthroughs. Mastectomy was done with the expander. And then it was swapped for an implant at a second surgery. And that brings us up to today where it's still done in two surgeries, but the nipple sparing mastectomy has become more popular. We can leave the skin behind, and now we're swapping for an implant at the second surgery still. 
So it looks a lot better, but it's still a problem. We've got two surgeries. Women still undergo painful expansion process. So it's just not perfect yet. So the question really was for me in my career, now we're back at 2005, can we do breast implant reconstruction in one surgery? And my answer was, look, look, pretend you're the plastic surgeon. You come in on a mastectomy, all of the skin is still intact. The short scar nipple, nipple sparing surgeries are now deemed to be safe. If a woman doesn't have cancer in your nipple, you don't need to remove it. It's something still shockingly new to people in the medical community. Um, therefore, there's no reason to use an expander. And so I would ask myself as I was in surgery, why am I putting an expander and I have all the skin? So that really led to me developing this one-stage breast reconstruction where implants should be possible at the time of the surgery. So this is based on something called Dermal Matrix. If you're familiar with it, it's a cadaveric product. You can use it to make a pocket at the time of the, um, of the oh, I don't know how to use this mouse either. This is fantastic. Look at that, here we go. All right, it can be used at the time of the mastectomy, make almost an internal bra sling that you put an expander or implant in. So let me walk you through how this surgery is going to be performed when I first started it out in 2005. We made the incision for the mastectomy through an inframammary crease, that means under the breast itself. The mastectomy surgeon then removed the whole breast through this incision which is technically hard to get them to do, by the way, and that took a lot of the will of making this happen. Then the pectoralis muscle is exposed and tied into, as you can see, this substance is dermal matrix, so it makes a pocket under the pec. The sizer's put in, you inflate it to the right size until you figure out what it is, then you take it out, put in, under the dermal matrix, an implant, the final implant. This is the patient at the end of the case, uh, two inframary crease incisions, maybe a little bigger than augmentation incision, and completed, you don't need to go back and do anything else unless there's another reason to. So these are my numbers, because once you know you can do it, the question is, is it a good idea to recommend it to others, okay? And is it increasing the risk for the patient in any way? So I compared my study of my first 78 patients to patients that were done with a tissue expander, some of these without dermal matrix, some of them with, to try to get a good comparison as to this risk effect. What I saw was that there was no statistical significant to increase risk of doing it this way. The two things that did strike me was that, of course, in my patients, which are in the first column, only 19% of them went on to choose to have a second surgery, usually fat grafting, whereas, of course, if you had a tissue expander, everyone has to go back and do another surgery. The other thing that came out of this, and this is gonna be relevant later in the talk, is that this problem called capsular contracture, um, some of you may be familiar with this, is like a harden, hardening around your breast implant with an abnormal appearance and pain. I didn't have any of that. So this was kind of struck me at the time. Why is this common complication a non-issue in my surgery? And we'll come back to that in a little bit. So um, let me just start this off in the middle. So this discovery of being able to do this in one step ultimately led to the founding of the Bedford Breast Center. This is a group I created in 2015. We have four surgeons, two surgical oncologists, two plastic surgeons, and this for that group is the standard of care. We do hundreds of surgeries a year. We do them outpatient. We uh, do all of the surgeries in one sp stage and where is appropriate, and now of course we're becoming famous for doing this surgery, we do nipple sparing mastectomies. So it really has improved the standard of care for our patients, and I'm starting to see a real positive impact, at least in the LA community as well, where now patients are going to their doctors saying, wait, wait, why do I need my nipple cut off again? Why can't you just put in the implant? So even if someone doesn't know how to do it, and of course I'm happy to teach everybody, people I think that the market pressure is now affecting the community, and so we're really increasing the standard in our, in our, um, in our community itself. Our complication rate is now down to less than 1% because of other advances in Provena wound back closures, Xperil, and other things which we've used to improve the surgery even more than when I originally did the study. Here's some typical results. These are literally our patients that I saw within the last week before I came here. This is a patient with left breast cancer. Here's her after a bilateral mastectomy. This is actually the patient from the video who showed up last week. Um, she, her, she is, she's a BRCA patient. She had multiple biopsies, had LCIS, ultimately decided to have a bilateral mastectomy. Here's her after her 
uh, bilateral mastectomy. You can cha change the size with this procedure as well, but you have to just respect the skin and not put any pressure on the skin pocket. So now let's go back to our other little question. What is capsular contracture? Now here's my, my problem. I'd have these patients that came in my office with hard implants that were raised, sometimes very raised. This patient had 15 prior fa failed capsular contracture surgeries. She was skin on implant. She didn't want to remove the implant because it was so deformed if she had. Um, what do I tell these patients? To understand the scope and breadth of this problem, I'll tell you about the 300,000 breast augmentations performed per year. In LA, you'd think it was more. Um, 90, <laughs> it's like half of the population of women, I think. Um, 91,000 breast reconstructions. Um, of that group, capsular contracture rates 30%, okay? So that's over their lifetime, so it may not happen immediately. The new contracture rate on average then is over 100,000 patients per year. And our surgery, which is our standard of care, removes the capsule, remove the implant, fails in 30 to 50% of these cases. Okay, so this is not something we have a very good, we have a, we have a problem, we don't have a good cure. We have an okay cure. Um, so it's a serious problem. And the standard treatment just doesn't work. So this is kind of what got me thinking, can we cure capsular contracture? Now you remember back to my study, I have of a 20% across the board rate with my comparison study of capsular contracture, mine at zero, right? And this is not just to pat myself on the back. Well, what the heck did I do differently that I didn't have this, this problem? Well, I didn't use a tissue expander, I just did went right to the implants, so I had one surgery, not two, maybe that made a difference. And also I used dermal matrix, whereas the other study didn't use dermal matrix. So this got me thinking, why do my breast reconstructions have a zero rate of capsular contracture, but overall the breast augmentation rate and reconstruction rate is 30%. Maybe what we should do is treat the capsular contracture patients like the breast reconstruction patients. Seems kind of really obvious, right? Um, put in a dermal bra, re-sterilize the pocket so as if it were the primary surgery, let's try it. So with multiple failed um, Patients with multiple failed attempts, I said, let's put in dermal matrix, let's put it in just like a breast reconstruction, let's see if this will work. The dermal matrix actually made sense. The reason is dermal matrix is, um, is a cadaver, it's a human product, and it's the, it's the dermis of the skin. Now, rather than an implant having a random scar tissue form around it, and then your body reacting with fibrosis to that, instead, what does your body see? It sees the back of dermis. So the interface between the body and the implant is now completely altered and it looks like human dermis. Your body's less likely to tighten it up. I don't know anyone has undergone random skin tightening lately, but generally it doesn't occur. Well, maybe if you're a plastic surgeon, a little bit. Um, so changes the body's interface with the capsule. Why is one surgery instead of two important? This has to do with biofilms. If anyone's an ortho in, he in here, they'll understand a biofilm is a low-grade bacterial, essentially contaminant, that lives on the surface of foreign bodies in your own human body, right? So you've got something that doesn't cause an infection, however, it's essentially a slime coat that your body can react in fibrose to. So maybe, and they're hard to diagnose, right? Because if you were to culture them, they're so low-grade, they might not even grow in culture, but their presence could form a capsular contracture. So let's try to get rid of that. So this study that was there for, Let's take my original study, 48 breasts and 32 patients, this is gonna be published this year. Use the dermal matrix to create an internal bra, sounds familiar. Re-sterilize the field, similar to when you have an open fracture case, pulse irrigate three liters of antibiotic irrigation, take everything that was touching the implant, the entire capsule, everything must come out and essentially try to re-sterilize the surgical field. So here's the crazy thing, it really worked. It didn't just kind of work. Every patient was cured who underwent this study. There is no recurrence in the 48 breasts for all of the patients done with a similar breast reconstruction algorithm. These patients I showed you were cured, plus everybody else I did was cured. So this has been a major, was really something done to, hey, let's see if we could figure this out, to, wow, this really worked. Biofilms were actually discovered in 30%. Um, and I suspect it might even be higher because it's hard to grow them. Little tricks such as take the capsule culture prior to giving IV antibiotics, things like that, increase the yield as we went through the study. So it's very interesting to see how much that multiple surgeries is a big negative factor when you talk about breast implants. 
Now we go to my last topic, which is what I'm currently working on, which is breast reduction and mastopexy. And why the heck doesn't it work? Okay, it doesn't work. So some women may have heard, oh, it only lasts for five years. Oh, it just resags again. Well, it's all true, okay? Um, why? Because you're taking something that's droopy and you're t cutting skin out, but the skin failed in the first place, as you can see in this patient. Uh, it depends on the breast tissue being lifted. If not, so to take this patient, looks pretty good, right? This is her one year out. Um, this is like the best of the best in these plastic surgery slideshows you can see when you access the 9021 plastic surgery site. But I, I, I challenge you to see it say, although this looks better, all the breast tissue is at the bottom, sagging and pulling again. You haven't really fixed the problem because you haven't changed the basic paradigm of saggy skin, saggy boobs. Sorry, saggy skin, scary boob ladies out there in the world, none of which are in this room. Um, in a few years, it will look as saggy as it does pre-op. So how do I use now my more reconstructive breakthroughs to assist with this? Now, the breast reconstructions weirdly look a lot better. So I'll see my patients now 10 years out. Of course, the one at top's gonna look good. She had cute fat boobs to begin with. How about the one in the bottom? Now, this is a patient that had a pretty bad cancer, had to go in and even take additional margin. But look at this breast, like it got lifted. Why? They stay up forever, hmm, that's good. They get a lift, they don't really have a scar. And so that questions us, why do we need a big scar for a regular breast lift? And these reconstruction worked for a long-term um, lift because they don't depend on the breast tissue to hold up, or the skin, to hold up the weight, right? So this patient was really striking. This is actually a young BRCA-positive patient. You can see this scar, uh, this uh, birthmark okay, look where this was, this is, not a, this is not a lift, okay? So why do we need a big scar for a regular breast lift? How do we apply that to the aesthetic part of the surgery? Can I put the whole breast under a dermal matrix pocket, under the pec? Okay, no, you can't do that because you have to do mammograms, you have to screen for breast cancer, this is a real problem. Um, but you can kind of do a very similar kind of cheat version of the same thing, which is you can lift up the entire pec fascia like a dermal matrix internal bra and put it under that. Let me go ahead and show you basically what that looks like in video format. This is done about a year ago when I started really working on this more aggressively. We'll just ignore the breast sound. So there's the breast. It's lifted up on what's called internal mammary perforators. There's the fascia. Now the goal is to actually tuck the breast tuck. into this fashion. You can even tuck, see tuck, without tuck. even sitting her up yet. But now look, this holds this in. So even the breast without any additional work is just sitting up in a higher position and no skin yet has been cut. All right, so that's basically how it works. You just tuck the whole breast under the fascia. So sometimes when I come up with the ideas, I've got to say I often think, duh. Right, and so you know when it's a good idea when you, you see something go, oh, Velcro, duh, I should have done that, right? Um, so here are some of my early results. I'm trying to show you things that are further out, but uh, this one I had so much skin on, I ended up making the cut, but the skin is under no tension, and the idea is to completely get rid of the scar at some point. The great thing about these is that, that even on the early ones, they have such good lift that it almost looks like an implant, like they, except for in a good way, not in a bad way, that they're not gonna sag or drop. Minimal skin risk removal is necessary. The scars look great because the skin's not holding it up. You're not putting it under tension. Of those of you surgeons in the room, you know a tensionless scar is the most desirable. There's great support of the, the, the um, breast tissue. And then finally, um, you can do crazy things that we never were able to do before. Like this woman was born with baby breasts or, you know, basically her breasts are in the middle of her abdomen. Um, so she had been to see plastic surgeon. She has some lipo scars under here. They tried to liposuction out the bottom of the breast. And so instead what I did is raised it up on a pedicle and just moved it where I wanted it to go. And then I took the nipple and I put it here, seemed like a good idea. And then the scar goes where the nipple was. So you can't really see the scar. And so you can just put it wherever you want it. Here's someone I just did a few um, weeks ago and she came in with an implant and this kind of same thing where you have a long, long, long chest and so I put the scar where her, she wanted the implant out, I put the scar where the nipple was. And the fun thing about her, and the reason I brought this in, even though it's a fresh photo, is she has a crease scar down here, which you can see that's where the bottom of her breast was down there. So when she rounds out and looks pretty, I think this will look great. And um, 
it's just shocking how much that this is her breast skin right here. Um, and you can really do things that we couldn't do before. So in conclusion, these three interrelated uh, discoveries, the one-stage breast reconstruction, um, here's a fun capsular contracture of hundreds more like these, kind of capsular contracture cure, and a subfascial breast lift are all related. My advice on breaking through uh, for all of you from what I learned myself is to use what you are taught uh, and become an expert in each of those things so you really see the flaw and, and the standard of care and can move to use what you know to really perseverate about the problem, question everything, and to strive to see connections to bring the, your entire field forward and synthesize these things, innovate them, and then study them, prove that they really work, and teach them to others. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was great. It's always great to see pushing the envelope with surgery and uh, new technologies developing in the operating room. Our next speaker is Julia Glade Bender, um, graduating class of 92 and currently an associate professor of pediatrics at Columbia. She has an impressive um, number of uh, organizations and um, accomplishments. Her main area is in precision medicine. She's a cutting edge physician scientist who has a number of national leadership roles. She's um, been prominent in many multiple consortia, including the NCI, a children's oncology group. She's had um, relationships with the pharmaceutical injury, uh, industry and the FDA. And the title of her talk will be Applying Targeted Therapy with Precision. Julia, thank you. So I'm going to try to do this a little bit of hybrid as well, because oftentimes no one can see me if I stand behind the podium, um, which is in part why I named the precision medicine program at Columbia University PIP-seek, um, because people say PIP-squeak, they always mess it up, and they're little PIPs, and I am too. So, um, And uh, really, um, I, there were a number of talks I could give. I decided that the best way to go about this was mostly uh, to tell you some incredible anecdotes so that you start to understand really the power of applying uh, clinical genomics uh, to real people. So childhood cancer for anybody who knows cancer is really a whopping success. Every decade, we see a, a really noticeable difference in the number of uh, patients that we can cure, such that at this juncture, over 80% of our patients are cured from pediatric cancer. But I always have to pick the hardest. So um, there, I would say that there are some diseases for which we're doing very well, and others for which we're doing quite poorly. And um, my focus is really entirely on that 20% that we're not curing. And so I do that in two ways. Um, I study new agents, and then I'm trying to figure out which agent goes with which child. Because generally speaking, when you do an early phase trial, you're, not, you're supposed to be agnostic. It's a dose-finding safety trial. But for the individual, they want to know if it's going to work. So it's good for the patient, and it's good for the child uh, good for the trial and good for the patient if you could actually match the patients most likely to respond to the right drug. The drug development pathway will be um, faster and your patient will do better. Um, and so that's really the precision medicine hypothesis and everybody knows the story of melanoma. Uh, many melanomas are driven by a BRAF V600E mutation. This constitutively activates um, the mech earth RAF pathway. And when they developed a BRAF inhibitor and treated patients with widely metastatic melanoma with this drug, there were really extraordinary responses. So the question was, could we do this in pediatrics? Kids really very rarely get something like melanoma. 
So we, we discovered sort of over the last decade that there are several targets in pediatrics. The first, of course, and because we're here at Penn Med, uh, was the Philadelphia chromosome positive um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, otherwise known as BCR ABLE. Um, and so there was Philadelphia positive ALL, was, which was actually the worst ALL you could have in children prior to Gleevec. Uh, and it's now curable and curable without bone marrow transplant. This target, um, uh, the drugs that target a BCR ABLE also target CKIT, which is an important uh, driver in adult cancer, but also in some pediatric cancers. We also learned, for example, that um, ALK is an important target. It's an important target for several pediatric diseases, uh, translocation-driven diseases like anaplastic large cell lymphoma and inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, and a lot of work done here at UPenn by John Maris and Yael Mosse have also shown as well that there are activating mutations in ALK in a, in a very bad disease called neuroblastoma. Low-grade gliomas have relative targets for which there are drugs, and Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Uh, also has activation of the same pathway, actually, as melanoma. So would it work in the clinic? So this is um, the uh, pet of a patient that came to me from Long Island with inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, and I had just opened Yael Massey's ALK inhibitor trial, and we knew that this patient had an ALK rearrangement. In the past, for a disease like this, you would treat with steroids, and it wouldn't work. But we had no data on the ALK inhibitor. So I actually said, though, this should work. And the family waffled. So I sent them down for a consult down here at CHOP. And they recommended the ALK inhibitor. And the family waffled. So they went up to Boston Children's, and they put them on steroid first, and nothing happened. And so then Boston got to put them on the same trial that we had all over. Um, and after one month of crizotinib, that's what the PET scan looked like. So it really does work. So we decided to set about at Columbia University setting up what would be a CLIA-compliant, multidisciplinary clinical sequencing program. And I really mean clinical. This is not research. We are billing for this and trying to make the case for reimbursement for clinical genetic sequencing. And this requires a, a, really a, a village. You need multidisciplinary support. You need to educate, and this is very important, and consent families. Then. Sample acquisition begins in the operating room. You need your surgeons on board. It needs to be flash frozen from the OR um, and then processed by pathology. Then you need an analytic path, um, pathway with really good uh, biostatisticians, bioinformatics, systems, biology people. Then we all get together and we sit in a room and we look at the data and we try to figure out what it means. Someone's got to tell the patient, that's again my job, and then you have to figure out what to do with it. So uh, we call this the Precision uh, in, in Pediatric Sequencing or PIPC Cancer Medicine Program. And the platform that we decided to use was clinical whole exome sequencing. So we are, D uh, we are sequencing all of the coding DNA. We also are looking at the RNA, the transcriptome, the message. But to, in order to interpret this, you also have to sequence the child, because that way you can tell what are the cancer-specific variants, but you're also going to learn about the germline variants. And then we can also learn about copy number var uh, variation, translocations, and gene expression. And I think nobody, when we started doing this, understood the power of this. But what we determined, really, in, in our first 100 patients, and this really holds true, and we've now done about 250 patients, is that what we thought we were going to do was just find actionable mutations, mutations for which there was a drug. And that's true in about 40% of high-risk patients. We really only did this for our high-risk patients, because if you're curing 80% of the others at least, why go through the whole thing? Uh, we, um, they were of diagnostic significance. Sometimes we had the pathologists had the diagnosis wrong, and we could really hone our diagnosis. They were, sometimes it told us prognostic significance. Um, there were some times where the clarification of the diagnosis actually really changed the therapy dramatically. And then there was this issue of germline cancer susceptibility. So let me tell you a few stories. 
So the first one is sort of a classic. Uh, a child, this child actually came from West Africa, had been undertreated for AML. We treated him, but unfortunately, he relapsed um, after four cycles of standard AML or acute myeloid leukemia um, therapy. He went, underwent a matched, unrelated bone marrow transplant, um, but unfortunately, by day 100, he had relapsed again. So we sequenced uh, his leukemia, and as you can see, this is what we call a pileup, and um, you can see all of the fragments, and where it's blue, it, it should have been, a, it looks like a T, but it turned into a G. But it's very clear here that this is only in the leukemia and not in the normal. This is a somatic mutation that's in the leukemia. And this was in the, in the, uh, in the pathway of, or the gene CKIT. CKIT is not normally mutated in AML, um, but it is mutated in, for example, gastrointestinal stromal tumor in adults. And so there was a lot of data on our old friend, imatinib. But this is what we would have called a, uh, a variant of uncertain significance, or a, a VOUS, or a VOUS. Um, because it really had never been reported, and it was in none of the databases uh, that we looked at, except for one. Dr. Google found this paper, um, <laughs> which had shown that this was um, uh, reported in one, uh, in one tumor with uh, one tumor in the lab, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So we treated the child with imatinib and the blast count came down dramatically. Now, this is not a cure, but this was about nine months of palliation. So that's sort of what we thought we were gonna do. But we found that you really had to go deeper than that. There are very few direct hits that are um, uh, single nucleotide variants. You really have to look deeper. So we had um, an eight-year-old girl with high-risk ALL who had been treated with standard therapy, and she was relapsed and again came in for therapy. And we tried two standard salvage rec uh, regimens, and we could not get her to go back into remission. Um, while treating uh, ALL in relapse is difficult, um, something smelled wrong to my colleague. She just said, this isn't behaving like ALL. So let's sequence the, the tumor. And again, you see that there's a somatic variation in the leukemia, although it doesn't affect every cell, but that may also um, represent some normal mixed in with leukemic blasts. And we found something, but unfortunately, what we found, the NT5C2 mutation, doesn't help us pick what does work. It just explains, perhaps, why this patient isn't responding. It's associated with uh, chemotherapy resistance. So then we went to the RNA. We went to the message. And there's a lot of good data out there uh, from GWAS studies about looking across all of pediatric cancers that, that, um, that was called the target initiative. And what my bioinformatics people did is they sort of mapped this child's expression pattern on that expression pattern, and it lined up with the uh, BCR ABLE um, or Philadelphia-like leukemias. So we have... Um, a DNA mutation that predicts resistance, and we have an RNA profile that looks like Philadelphia positive or a BCR able like. So um, we actually had to go to whole genome sequencing in this patient to find what was a NUP214 able fusion. Um, and this had been previously reported. And again, because it's BCR able like, it responds to drugs that are like imatinib, this one to satinib. And we actually had clinical data because chemotherapy with tisatinib was in clinical trials at the time, so we knew we could combine the two safely. Um, and the patient went into uh, ready remission, underwent a bone marrow transplant, and um, this story uh, was written up in the Columbia Alumni Magazine. She's now two years post-transplant and cured of her disease. Um, so you may say, if I told these stories and there were other pediatric oncologists in the room, they'd be like, yes, so what? because, you know, imatinib, disatinib, you know, these are not really innovative drugs. Well, that's, that's a problem that adults and pediatrics are having, that, you know, our problem in pediatrics is access to drugs. And that's my other job. My other job is trying to get drugs developed for kids. And very, very few, generally speaking, fewer than 10% of people who have a match can actually get the drug. And believe it or not, this is also true in adults. I think the number is about 10% in adults. 
So a lot of my efforts now are working on access to drugs. Um, so for example, we have studied a lot of small molecules in pediatrics, um, but really only two, imatinib and ruxolitinib, have FDA approvals for children. All the other drugs are off-label indications for children and very hard to get, and by the way, extremely expensive. Imatinib, luckily, is off patent, so that's an easy one. What about refining diagnosis? So this was, this was, again, an astute physician. We had a young girl with AML. She was actually referred for transplant because her, her platelets never recovered after therapy, and we couldn't get all of the therapy in because it, you're supposed to have intensify therapy. So we said, OK, let's transplant her um, in first remission, even though her platelets haven't fully recovered. And so, of course, the easiest place to look is a sibling. But the astute physician said, OK, she's a perfect HLA match, but her platelets are kind of on the low side as well. So we decided actually to sequence both the patient, and now this is constitutional sequencing, the whole body, um, both the patient and the sister, because we had tried all the targeted testing that we could think of for myelodysplastic syndromes and couldn't find any. And so when we sequenced it, we found actually that not only did the patient have a RUNX1 mutation, which predisposed her to developing an AML, but her sister had it too. So now you have a problem. Do you transplant with the sister? And in the end, the transplanters decided to transplant from an unrelated donor. Um, and we're still deciding, what do you do with someone who you know carries a predisposition for AML, which is a really tough disease to treat? And that brought us to really the second, I think, astounding thing that we've learned along the line, which is that the germline findings that we're finding are really far more prevalent than we ever expected. When kids come in with their families and you diagnose them with cancer, the first thing they ask is, why did this happen? And the second thing they ask you is, is my other child at risk? And prior to doing this, we used to say, no, it's dumb bad luck, it's random. And unfortunately, it's looking more and more like it's not so random. However, there is a, there's a component of randomness, but the predisposition to cancer is far more prevalent than we ever thought. But how do you manage risk? Um, prevalent and predisposition don't mean 100%, or very rarely, except in this case, which was another child. Again, they just happened to be leukemias were the best cases. This was a child who had, uh, again, acute myelogenous leukemia, bad disease, um, was referred in for bone marrow transplant because had relapsed um, with a solid form of AML in the brain. We sequenced that, and we found in, in the leukemia a very high fidelity mutation in a gene called RET. Well, we didn't think this really probably had anything to do with leukemia. But we do know that RET is a cancer gene. It's actually associated with familial medullary thyroid cancer, or MEN2A. So this was actually an incidental finding in a child who had leukemia of another cancer predisposition. Um, and we proved that it was germline by sequencing the normal um, as well. And so actually, in this disease, the risk of developing medullary thyroid cancer is about 95%. It's, it's almost complete penetrance. And so when the family came in for their 100-day follow-up from the transplant, my first question, because they had been returned results by clinical genetics, I said, to, I said to the parents, are either one of you a carrier? The father said, yes, I've just been um, told I'm a carrier. And I said, you're here. Do me a favor. Let me feel your thyroid and send some screening labs. This was on a Friday afternoon. By um, Friday night, I got my CEA back. It was about three times normal. Um, and then on Monday, I got the calcitonin back, normal being about 10. It was 300. He was completely asymptomatic. And by the way, on my exam, I'm a horrible thyroid feeler, but I really felt like I felt some fullness in the left neck. So I had called um, the endocrinologic surgeons on Friday when I saw this family and asked them to see him on Tuesday. They did a fine needle aspirate on Tuesday. He had medullary thyroid cancer. He was scheduled and had his thyroid out and 30 nodes the next uh, Monday. Um, and six of those nodes were positive, including a, a, a low-level node. And so he had stage 4A medullary thyroid cancer, the father, with no symptoms. So 
Um, we then screened the rest of the family, and unfortunately, they have five kids, uh, four of whom, including our patient, are carriers. And one of these uh, children has a um, elevated calcitonin already and will have a prophylactic thyroidectomy this summer. So these are real people. You know, this is the family. Um, I'm able to show this uh, photo because this sequencing was paid for by the Sohn um, Conference Foundation. Um, and they paid for the family sequencing. They're paying, um, they're paying for every child in the tri-state area to have sequencing done at Columbia. And so, as the mother will tell you, you know, sequencing her son um, has protected the health of five out of seven members of her family. So in conclusion, uh, you know, first of all, implementing a clinical genomic uh, precision medicine program is feasible. Uh, genomic findings impacted the clinical care of two-thirds of our patients whom we sequence. The physician's role, I can't say enough, remains critically important. There's still, you still have to have a clinical suspicion. You got to know which tests you want to order. You got to know how to interpret them. And you need to safely act on your results. Um, and as I showed you, the impact of these genomic findings goes way beyond uh, targeted mutations. And so, obviously, doing something like this takes a huge team, a huge family. Um, and I'm supposed to say something about the University of Pennsylvania and how it set me up to do this. So this is my family. Um, the University of Pennsylvania was incredibly kind to me when I was a student. Um, I was in love with a man, my husband, Jonathan. We went through nursery school through the fifth grade together. We met back in college. He went to law school in New York, and I went to UPenn for medical school. Um, we traveled back and forth. I broke down at every uh, station on the New Jersey Turnpike with my car. I used to call my mom crying, and she'd say, what exit? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, in my fourth year of medical school, Penn said to me, um, I said, can I do my away rotations in New York? It's, it's enough already. And I did almost every rotation um, in New York my fourth year of medical school. And I tell everybody this. What I, first of all, what I learned was there was no better medical school than Penn Med. Penn Med put the students first. Everywhere else, I was an appendage. Um, but it also taught me how to be flexible. And I really needed to turn, uh, be flexible in order to raise five children and do what I do. And, um, and I coach a lot of women as well, and I say, if you can articulate what it is you want to do, someone's gonna let you do it, and hopefully someone will let you do it with a little bit of flexibility. Um, and this was important, especially because, um, again, oops, two of these kids, um, my, uh, the two blondes on the end, um, whoops, anyway, they were my brother's children. My brother passed away 10 years ago, and my very flexible and uh, wonderful husband, we took them in and went from three to five. And again, it's um, the support of my colleagues and the skills that I learned at Penn Med that let me continue my career when I thought it was over. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing and for your expertise in moving precision medicine forward, Julia. Thank you. The bad news is there's not much time left. We're scheduled to go to 345, so I'm going to ask the two final speakers, Michelle and Darrell, to hold as tightly to 10 minutes as possible. We're going to switch gears to Michelle Morse, graduated in 2008, uh, and um, with a little bit of a different spin with a, a tremendous set of examples on global outreach. I think the first hint of this was her French degree at the University of Virginia in 2003, which I guess was a harbinger of your interest in other cultures, and, and you've done some tremendous things in terms of the delivery of healthcare to global initiatives. She's the founding co-director of Equal Health, which I'm sure she'll explain. And she was involved um, uniquely uh, in the Haiti earthquake, re uh, earthquake relief effort and delivering health care during that difficult time. Dr. Morse. Can you hear me okay? Great. 
I'm going to use the mic as well. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, rather. I'd like to start just by thanking um, the medical school, the alumni panel, um, the dean, and all of you for being here this afternoon. It's quite an honor to get to speak with you about my work. Um, I am going to go as quickly as possible and maybe finish in eight minutes. Um, but my hope is to speak with you a little bit about the work that I started in 2003 as a first year medical student here at Penn um, that accelerated when I took a year out from medical school from 2006 to 2007 to live in Botswana um, and has really continued to accelerate since then. Um, I hope that you'll leave at the end of these eight minutes thinking, as I do, that the most pressing issue in health in the world, especially in America, is this issue of inequity. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk about um, what this title means, Introduction to Social Medicine, How to Address the Statement, Inequity Kills. Um, my work, as, as you've heard already, is predominantly global, but has shifted to American uh, health inequities, specifically since November of 2016. Um, I want to start by just mentioning um, how important it is that we rethink medical education. Um, one of the things that I think I realized during my five years of medical school here at Penn is that we spent a tremendous amount of our time learning, especially in the preclinical years, basic sciences. And it's not to say that that's not fundamental, but when you look at this particular slide, and I know the colors and, and contrast is not great, I think you can see, hopefully, at the, well, at the top here, that if you look at the causes of premature mortality and the causes of poor health, um, we tend to focus so much of our education on the healthcare component, um, which is only about 10% of determinants of poor health outcomes. And this study has been repeated over and over and over again. Um, but 40% of the outcomes of health are actually socioeconomically determined. And I know this is a buzzword now, everyone's talking about social determinants of health, but I think it's really important to recognize that there's a mismatch between this and the way we spend our years in training, not just for physicians, but also for nurses and other health professionals. And so the work that I've been doing in Haiti, in Botswana, in Rwanda, in Liberia, and also now in Boston, is predominantly focused on this idea that, in, in fact, we are miseducating health professionals in some ways about what the true major causes of poor health are. And that's true in the US as well as globally, unfortunately. And that I have really decided to make this decision to focus on re-educating health professionals. So I'm someone who's interested in the intersection of medical education, social justice, and the social determinants of health. Um, and this is not a new problem. So if Verkow had designed all of the curricula for all medical schools, we might not be in the place that we're in right now. But in the 1840s, Verkow, who many of you know from uh, his clinical excellence, was actually a father of social medicine. And we'll talk a little more about what social medicine is. But he was saying in 1848 that medicine needed to be both a, a medical science, a clinical science, as well as a social science. And that the health of the poor, in particular, is a matter of direct societal concern. So this gets back to some of what was already mentioned earlier today. And not only is it old, <laughs> this issue of kind of how we educate health professionals about what the true causes of poor health are, um, it's also global. Um, and so this is a, a, I don't know if any of you use Global Mapper, but it really shows kind of by um, health indicator um, and maps that to geography and shows disproportionate, um, you know, both health outcomes, disease mapping. And this happens to be the concentration of health professionals globally. And so when I was a medical student in 2006, I was one of the first Penn medical students to spend a year in Botswana. This was very early on in the Botswana partnership. I saw this acutely because I was one of the few health professionals at Princess Marina Hospital taking care of patients in this year. And this map shows that in Africa, even though there's a disproportionate number of illnesses, the concentration of health professionals there is woefully inadequate. Um, along those same lines, those health professionals that are being trained in Africa and other global South countries, as well as health professionals, medical students here in the US, were not taught this map of the fact that most diseases certainly have a biological component. If you take tuberculosis, for example, 
and I did this a ton in Botswana as a medical student, you look under the microscope, you see the acid fast bacillus, there's your biological diagnosis of tuberculosis. But if you take a step back and think about, well, what are the behaviors that might cause someone to have um, active tuberculosis? And then take another step back. What are some of the societal factors that might cause that person to have those behaviors and then develop tuberculosis, whereas someone else doesn't? And then take a, a, a step further back and think of the structural causes. Um, this is not how we're taught to think. When in fact, if we want to address that 40% of the causes of poor health outcomes, this is how we have to think. Um, if you take that a step further, take those four concentric circles a step further, you'd start to think about this idea of upstream actions versus downstream actions. And the point is not to say that medical students should now you know, move to Washington DC and all get masters in public policy and become full-time you know, advocates and policy people, but it is to say that we're not gonna achieve good health for all people, um, and I'm someone who believes that healthcare is a human right and that everyone deserves access to healthcare no matter where they're from, then you know, the idea is that we have to at least be thinking about this realm even if we as doctors are not doing the day-to-day -day work. Um, and I hope to make that argument clear in the next couple of slides. But again, if you think about upstream actions as compared to downstream actions, um, the thing here I think that, that's most powerful is what was the impact of the Social Security Act, for example, on the health of the elderly? Um, we don't think in those terms oftentimes, but these upstream actions often have a tremendous impact on the health of populations and communities, but are not seen as clinical um, interventions. I'd also say, and I'm gonna um, breeze through this definition of social medicine and just tell you that social medicine is actually the approach to medicine that understands the, the statement inequity kills through social analysis and societal analysis and then demands that you act differently as a health professional based on knowing that poor health outcomes are not purely biological. That's what social medicine is. Um, and if you look at where health uh, professionals' education has gone over the past 15, 20, 30 years since the Flexner Report came out in the 1910s, you'll see that there's been a transformation in how health professionals have been educated. Julio Frank, who's the former dean of the Harvard School of Public Health and is now president of the University of Miami, put this paper out now almost 10 years ago, um, describing that health professionals need to be educated not just in a formative way, way where we learn the technical aspects of clinical medicine, but also in a transformative way such that they can be global leaders in changing how medicine is practiced in an, and in achieving good health. Um, and I hope that social medicine is a path for us to be able to do that. I just have to read this because again, I think it helps us to think a little bit outside of the box of what our role is as health professionals and as faculty educators. Um, incorporating an explicit focus on social justice in medical education will lead to the training of physicians who understand that to advance the goal of health for all, they must work toward more equitable distribution of healthcare and the elimination of health disparities both within the US and internationally. And again, my belief, based on now about 14 years of doing this work, is that this is the most pressing health challenge for our world. Um, and I think that again, since November, that has accelerated. Um, so I, I encourage you to challenge these concentric circles. These are a different set of concentric circles, but they're really defining what is our professional obligation as health professionals. Are we only, um, uh, uh, is it only important for us to focus on individual patient care, access to care, and direct socioeconomic influences? Or can we expand beyond and think about these areas of professional aspiration? I'd encourage all of you to ask yourselves that question. And uh, it's too bad the dean just walked out because, the <laughs> because this paper is tremendously important and looks at this very question of how do we connect issues of social inequity and poor health with how we train health professionals. And so uh, Fitzhugh Mullins, a leader in this work, he created a social mission score, which has three components. It's the number of graduates from a medical school that serve in primary care after graduation, the number of those health professionals that work in underserved settings, and the number of those health professionals that are underrepresented in medicine. And that combined three-part score was used to rank all of the medical schools in America. And you'd be surprised to know that that ranking is the actual complete flip of the US News and World Report ranking. The schools that rank the highest in social mission score rank the lowest in US News and World Report. And that tells us something about how our medical education system is set up. Um, and I was gonna ask the dean what our social mission score is here, but <laughs> maybe next time. Um, 
I do think it's important to recognize that talking about social medicine and social medicine as an approach to education of health professionals is not just some philosophical thing. There are actual tools that we can use to do this, to change how we teach and train our health professionals. One tool is talking about the history of medicine. And I remember as a medical student learning a tiny bit about this as a, as a first year medical student, but we don't talk a lot about the fact that the history of medicine is tremendously racist. Um, eugenics and the movement of eugenics was a way of using biology and biological discovery and science to rationalize a racist view of what poor health was about. And if we knew that, it might change how our health professional students and medical students act today in the healthcare system. Specifically, you might think, well, eugenics was in the 1920s, 1930s. It's got nothing to do with what health professional students think today. And in fact, just this past fall, fall of 2016, there was a study in the National Academy of Science that showed that UVA medical students thought that black patients had different skin thickness and different tolerance to pain medications than white patients. This is, you know, six months ago. So these beliefs that started with eugenics are still present today, and we are not doing enough to counteract that. Um, rethinking the social history is another social medicine tool that you can use in addition to teaching about the history of medicine. Rethinking the social history is about thinking about new topics. Instead of just asking, do you smoke cigarettes? Do you drink alcohol? And, you know, do you, you know, a couple of other things. These questions are things like, do you think your race has ever impacted your experience in the healthcare system? What, uh, do you have issues in terms of your documentation status? Are you an undocumented immigrant and how might that impact your access to healthcare? I'd encourage all of you to read this paper. Um, the other tool I wanna mention is Kamara Jones. Could you just raise your hand if you've heard of Kamara Jones? All right, so wonderful. So hopefully you guys will all be able to read more about Kamara Jones's work. She's a social epidemiologist and pediatrician who trained in the social medicine residency in New York in Montefiore. And she talks about this allegory of the gardener's tale, which describes how racism and healthcare works. It's another tool in social medicine that will help you to teach your students. Um, I'm not gonna have time to talk about equal health, unfortunately, but if you're interested, please follow, follow, find me afterwards. But the idea in equal health, our work is focused on capacity building and creating equal opportunity for Haitian health professionals. And movement building for us has become a movement of social medicine students who've graduated from our training programs in Haiti, who have started their own student movement to teach social medicine all across the country, and it's spreading to the US as well. Um, I want to end with this, um, this photo, because uh, I'm at nine minutes. Um, this is from 40th and Walnut Street in Philadelphia. I didn't mention that I grew up in West Philadelphia a few weeks from here, so being back here today is tremendously personal. Um, the changes I've seen in West Philadelphia from being a kid here to now are tremendous and complicated. And when I was a first year medical student in 2003, I remember walking from my, my uh, home to the campus and seeing this photo. Um, this is a, a poster um, where community organizers in West Philadelphia were organizing for land rights um, and were fighting to not have all of their land taken over um, and bought out um, such that you know, they were forced to move to other parts of the city. Um, and I think that Penn has an important role um, in that. And we unfortunately are not having enough of a dialogue about Penn's role in it. Um, but I'll never forget it because I, I think if I had knew, known more about social medicine back then, I might have been at some of these community meetings and might have thought more deeply about how the connection between Penn and the West Philadelphia community could have been improved. Um, so I'll stop there and say thank you and sorry to go over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle, for your noble effort and global outreach and everything you're doing. Last speaker uh, is Darrell Porter, who after getting his undergraduate degree at UCLA in neuroscience, um, got both medical and MBA degrees here at Penn and combined degree 1997 and eight, then went to McKinsey and has had a really prolific career in the biopharmaceutical industry working with AbbVie and Amgen, and until, I'm told, two days ago, was the uh, Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Planning at Gilead Sciences, but 
is now off on a new endeavor. <laughs> so hopefully that's gratifying, and let's let's uh, interested to hear your comments today. Thank you, Darrell. standing up and, uh, <laughs> and uh, that, that's been tough and for me and I'm going to go, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm actually going to take it all the way back to the beginning. So I'll touch on topics very similar to what Dr. Blood discussed and I'll focus on just one aspect of our industry and that's the biopharma industry. And I'll talk a little bit about just the economics and a bit of an overview. And I, I titled this Innovation and Reputation, Are We Turning a Corner? Uh, when, I, when I talk to a lot of my colleagues in healthcare broadly or specifically physicians, I generally get negative sentiments about biopharma. And a lot of it's appropriate and I understand some of the reaction to it. But I wanted to just comment on and actually pose the question to this group. Uh, based on what we're seeing and some of the actions that we're taking in the industry, are we now turning a corner? So uh, being publicly traded companies, being in a capitalistic society, the focus for large companies in the biopharma industry is growth. And I just took one chart here looking at very large companies that you all are familiar with, Merck, Novartis, Roche, Pfizer, et cetera, and showing their five-year growth rate after they reached $20 billion in revenue. So how fast were these companies able to grow? That's the mantra, that's the mandate. They all seek to do it. And historically, they've achieved it over, over the years. And again, some of these are going back in 1996, for example, Johnson & Johnson was able to grow about 9% a year after 1996. And they did it in a number of different ways. Some of them included acquisitions, which are listed here at the bottom. But the point is, Historically, companies have found a way to grow. And how did that happen? So fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your position, most of that growth historically came from the United States of America versus the rest of the world. And disproportionately in the US, it came from price. And so you can see here two charts. One is just showing 1990, looking to 2015 in global sales. You see half of the growth actually came from the United States of America as opposed to other markets. And then when you actually look at the U.S. in a bit more detail, essentially all of the growth came from price. And that's been part of the criticism <coughs> in the industry. And as this chart shows, that's what we're seeing. So... As we've started to, one, respond uh, to the feedback as an industry, we've pivoted towards addressing higher unmet medical needs. And during all today, not only this discussion, but the discussion earlier, you hear a lot of the innovation, and specifically oncology, but in other diseases where the industry really has pivoted to try and address high unmet medical needs. We're not talking about addressing you know, moderate issues or things that are particularly not as relevant. We tried to focus on usually life-saving areas. And this is just one chart. There are many, many examples. You see here projects. Uh, and projects are basically, you know, research projects. And then on the right are compounds. So literally new molecular entities that are in development. And so in 2015, and this is roughly the same today, you know, there are about 5,000 drugs in development globally. And a disproportionate amount of those, which I highlight here, are in areas of high unmet medical need, predominantly cancer, inflammation, uh, and um, infectious diseases are the, the big areas. So the industry is really starting to pivot. And again, there are many other representations of here. And not only from a development perspective, but from an M&A. So what we've been doing in the industry is looking at where innovation is taking place, but if not within the company's four walls, we will aggressively go out and try to push it. And so this chart is showing M&A volume, both in dollars and in, in numbers, from 2007 to 2015, 
not only the amount of M&A, mergers and acquisitions, but literally where we've been focused. And again, disproportionately, oncology is the top, uh, orphan diseases, so generally areas that have not historically been addressed by the biopharmaceutical industry, as well as infectious diseases. So again, the industry has started to pivot a bit more towards the areas of higher unmet need. And this one I wanted to add, so, you know, this, this pivot towards higher unmet medical need and innovation has really exploded. And Dr. Blood mentioned this as well. I think we're at not only broadly in healthcare, but specifically in uh, the biotech and biopharmaceutical industry, we're seeing an explosion of new developments. And I just pulled one example here. This is cellular engineering. Uh, with Penn obviously being at the leading edge of this development, but there's just been an absolute proliferation of new developments in this particular area. Uh, you can see here uh, on the left, Novartis uh, with CTL-019. Obviously, that's the product that's been in development with Penn here in Dr. June. And then we also see down below Team Unity, which is the new company that Dr. June has developed and recently spun out of Penn. Uh, focused on TCRs. So there's just a lot of development that you're starting to see in turning the corner uh, for the company and for our industry. <clears throat> so the, the, my last slide, uh, to keep it brief, is also pricing. So again, Dr. Blood touched on this. I, I think we in the industry understand that the criticism that we've received about pricing has been fair in the law in a large measure, not in every single case, but in large measure. Um, the company that I recently left, Gilead Sciences, uh, for better or for worse, was the poster child of challenges about pricing. So as many of you are familiar with, the company developed a product for hepatitis C uh, called Sovaldi, which was the first one, and then there was a, a second drug called Harvoni, right beyond that. It's a cure for hepatitis C. And I uh, had a fixed treatment duration, uh, depending on which genotype you could be treated typically in 12 weeks, some as short as eight, some as long as 24. Um, but the, the innovation was expensive. And the first product was $84,000 for a treatment, for a 12 week treatment. And there was an explosion of adoption of that product. And ultimately societies and countries could not afford it. And there was a lot of pushback, and really had responded by lowering the price ultimately in half. Um, and uh, but you know there was a lot of negative blowback, and I think that's something that the industry has continued to contend with. And so in response to that, you're starting to see things like this. This is just one example. Um, Allergan, which is a large company in our industry, they've developed what they call a social contract. And this was uh, sponsored by their CEO, Brent Saunders. And it's four different principles, but the, the one I highlight here is on access and pricing. And this is particularly notable for us. For any of you that follow it closely, the statements that are here are actually very unique for our industry because some of the more egregious offenders have violated these principles. So first and foremost, you know, we commit to these responsible pricing ideals um, we price our products in a way that's with or lower than the value they create. We enhance patient access to patients. We'll work with policymakers and payers. We will not engage in price gouging actions, right? And so obviously there have been some very notable recent examples of that. Uh, we will limit price increases. Uh, and then obviously we will not engage in taking major price increases without corresponding. So this is very important in comparison to the earlier slide I showed where most of the growth in the U.S. or all of the growth in the U.S. came from prices. And so this is the industry self-policing itself and essentially saying we will try and modulate the way we handle pricing in our industry going forward. And therefore, you ask us not only as partners, but also as patients and, and family members of patients to hold us accountable on developing new innovations and bringing innovative products to the market. So that's it. Thank you.
I'd like to thank, thank you, Darrell, thank all the speakers. And uh, we're past our time allotted. We're supposed to go to 345. If anyone has any particularly burning questions, I'm sure the panelists would be very willing to answer. Otherwise, we can take that um, after the after the session's concluded. Go ahead. I'd like to reiterate, but where else in the world can you get five people to give you perspectives of what is great at the University of Pennsylvania, what is great in America in, in, in a variety of different things? What other country can do this? Are we perfect? No, but we are, there's no other country that can do this. And that's part of the problem that we have to do a lot we don't get it all right. Thank you. Well, we can keep going. If, uh, people want. All right. um, I hope all of you who've spoken and are here for the reunion have a good time with old colleagues and friends and uh, enjoy the rest of the day and dinner tomorrow. Um, thank you very much for all of you for attending. <laughs>